The service begins on page 351 in the Book of Common Prayer. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. I invite... I invite the congregation to kneel and we continue on page 350. Hear the commandments of God to his people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage. You shall have no other gods but me. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not make for yourself any idol. Your God. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Honor your father and your mother. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not commit murder. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not commit adultery. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not steal. You shall not be a false witness. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Jesus said, the first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbors. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, by what we have not done, we have not loved thee with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
A reading from Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 130, which can be found in the Book of Common Prayer, page 784. And we'll say this together in unison, beginning after the asterisk in the first verse. Out of the depths have I called to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. If you, Lord, were to note what is done amiss, O Lord, who could stand? For there is forgiveness with you, therefore you shall be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits for him. In his word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O oh, Israel, wait for the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, with him there is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all their sins. A reading from the letter to the Romans. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, Though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The hymn appointed for this time is hymn 508. <laughs>
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister. Mary was one was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then, after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said, yes. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but there was still a place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept his, this man from dying? Then Jesus, again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, 
Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe what you sent that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. At this time, Ms. Fallon is grabbing, you can be seated, it's okay. Ms. Fallon is grabbing the cross for the Children's Chapel. So children who wish to go and have Children's Chapel may do so at this point. And that is children is a self-defining term and all may, some should, none must. So we're uh, letting them have some time to reflect on the things that they heard in their own special way. And, yep, here we go. We, we have some folks who aren't quite sure about all this. <clears throat> Separation anxiety, yeah, it starts early. Um, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, here we have a mosaic of Jesus raising Lazarus, followed by... Oh, something even more, far more gruesome. And I'm going to talk to you this morning about uh, Ezekiel, but I'm going through the Gospel of John. In this place and in this time, Jesus, who loved his friend Lazarus, used a moment that God gave him to state more fully about the power of God that was pounding through him. He is eternal life. And that he came to emphasize in this moment, and this particular being raised from the dead, not resurrection, but being raised from the dead, seems more like resuscitation, happens to Lazarus. Let me also state that there are lots of people who reading the Gospel of John now think that it was Lazarus who wrote that Gospel. If you want more explanation, I can give it to you later. But this was personal, being raised from the dead. And there is this wonderful reading from Ezekiel about another kind of raising from the dead. And it is the precursor toward our individual resurrections. Now, why do I say that? In early Israel, they did not have a very well-developed sense of what happens when one dies. In fact, they stayed away from it as if it were blasphemy because God was God and they were not, and they were embodied spirits of God in human flesh, and they thought that was enough to say in that moment. But over time, they do begin to wonder, especially because they've not yet been able to enjoy, they think, the promised land in the way they think God promised it. And part of that is true, because if we listen to Ezekiel, through the, especially the first half of his book, he's saying the people of Israel were rebellious in nature. They didn't like to follow God, and they liked to do their, the things they wanted to do the way they wanted to do them. And as a result, things were happening around them that would begin to bring their nation down. They'd been around for probably almost 400 years. And knocking at the door of Jerusalem at this point in time were the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar. Please don't ask me how to spell Nebuchadnezzar. I couldn't do it on a bet. Not even for a bottle of bourbon. 
But Nebuchadnezzar was there, and Ezekiel, whose prophetic ministry lasts from the late 7th century to the early, I mean, the, yeah, the late 7th century to the early 6th century B.C., that's a long time ago, folks, was there to try and help the people of Israel understand where they were in their relationship with God and how God would restore that relationship. And this, this wonderful imaging of a valley of dry bones, well, maybe a creepy image of a valley of dry bones, is the image that Ezekiel used to portray God's power. And so this is not individual resurrection. This is the res restoration of the people of Israel through the power of the Holy Spirit by God. Jesus isn't in the picture yet. We just get God and his spirit, and this looks pretty desiccated and dry. But that's not what God wanted for his people. And so even though they were a people now in exile, God wanted to assure them how much he loved them and how it would work. And this, I think, this picture is how the Israelites felt because they had lost their land, lost their king, and lost their place of worship. All the things that grounded them in their identity had been taken away, and they were living in a strange land with strange people, and the desiccation felt profound. And yet God says, I can restore this people. And so the image he gives the prophet is of a restored group of dry bones which get ligaments and flesh and breath once again to live fully the kind of life that God had promised to his people. And this imaging and more theological reflection leads the people to this understanding that there might be a general resurrection as well, a place where all God's people would be restored and renewed. Because the experience of the people of Israel is how could the people who in this exile are living and trying to be faithful, how can they know the goodness of God? And they began to think about those moments when they were being a faithful people and death still happened. Now, I want to talk to you about this because one of the things that's been interesting in my lifetime is I got to see at a very young age the peak level of church attendance in the United States of America. It happened about 1965. By the way, in 1965, the baby boomers started going to college. And after that, things started going downward as a trend. I bring this up because we have seen in our own experience, especially since the end of COVID, that things are not hopping like they used to. And I wish I could tell you I was discouraged about this, but I'm not. Because it's not me that's in control, it's God. And I think that's what God was trying to tell Ezekiel. Now, I will give you some of the desiccation numbers that are happening to our churches. The Episcopal Church, since 2011, has declined by 30%. That's a big number. It's not a defeatist number, it's just the reality we have. I will also tell you that the generations who follow the boomers, so if you're not a boomer, if you're a Gen X or a millennial or a Gen Z, and you're here, God bless you. Somehow somebody got the message to you that there's more in life than what we in this country have begun to offer our young people. By the way, I was lucky when I grew up in that place and time because I had a set of parents and grandparents and friends who thought 
that one of the places that you went to find true meaning in life was in church and in relationship to God. And I think that's still true. But we've had incredible salespeople in the secular world trying to tell us our job opportunities, our, our degrees from where we graduate, um, having flat screen TVs, having all the food we can possibly want, and all of those things which really are nice but don't give meaning are where you should find your meaning. Politics celebrities, all sorts of things that distract us. And even though I make fun of my own dogs for being distracted by squirrels, I sometimes think that humans say squirrel an awful lot too. We are a people to be grounded in God. And we have the Holy Spirit on our side. And we have the promises that were made in Ezekiel and through Jesus about where life really is and how it is to be lived. And so I think from time to time our bishops sit and scratch their heads. They've recently been in a House of Bishops meeting. I haven't seen any communications from it. I hope they made it through well. But the thing that is important about this is that faith in God and not faith in the world around us is where we need to put our hope. And both of these readings, the reading of Lazarus and the reading of Ezekiel, are readings of hope. They're readings about God does not leave us. God does not abandon us, even in our distraction and our uncertainty. God stays with us and breathes new life into us. Now, I will tell you a few things. One, since the early 1960s and probably from a little before that, the, the place that the church held in our culture has been displaced. It just has been. People are looking for other things. Experts, experts, uh, uh, government officials, business leaders, all sorts of places. But the people who come to church and at least think that this is the best place to trip over eternal meaning will be the leaders of the faith communities going forward. Now, one of the things I admire about the Jewish people is it's been a long time since they held the central place in a culture. They did in the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And so they can teach us a lot about how to rely on God when we don't have favor from government officials or anyone else. And I've had some interesting conversations with rabbis about this place. And they too see what we're about to experience and say, you know, we're happy to give you some insight to what that means. Now, I will tell you, I'm not discouraged because I think it gives us an incredible opportunity to be church as God intends, not to be an adjunct to culture or anything else. And sometimes, as Jesus shows in his own experience, the officials are not comfortable with people having true life. You see it there today in this gospel about Lazarus. Jesus is there to raise him from the dead, and a whole bunch of people get really upset and say, whoa, if this guy has this power, we need to get rid of him. Here's the thing I'm here to assure you. Jesus gives us that same power. I'm not sure that we could raise Lazarus from the dead, but we certainly can raise our churches up before God. Raise our churches up before our neighbors. Raise our churches up to serve our neighbors. I don't know what the church is going to look like in 50 years. I really don't. 
If you go back hundreds of years, you'll see that the church has developed and changed over time because resurrected bodies do not exactly become the same as the body they replace. If you read the Gospels as we will coming up, people don't immediately recognize Jesus when they see him resurrected. And they may not recognize us either. But we at our core will be the people who love Jesus and whom Jesus loves. The readings of Lent are about getting right with God. Some people think of that as oppressive and hard. I think of it as joyful and loving. It gives us a chance to expand ourselves into that place. And I have full confidence and faith that God will do the work through us by means of the Holy Spirit. So, our job is to know the Holy Spirit better, understand the story we've been given, and know our place in that story. We stand in an incredible place, and yeah, the world has changed, but God does not abandon the world. He gives it new life, new ligaments, new skin, new flesh, new breath. We continue with the Nicene Creed. It is found on page 358. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please feel free to kneel as you're able. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church and the world. Almighty and ever-living God, who in your holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, receive these our prayers which we offer to your divine majesty, beseeching you to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin, the Bishops of Virginia, Mark, Gail, Dabney, David, and Ted, the Bishop of the Azo Diocese, Isaac, and priests of the Church, Tracy and Timothy, that they may, both by their life and doctrine, set forth your true and lively word and rightly and duly administer your holy sacraments. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And to all your people, give your heavenly grace. 
and especially to this congregation and the Azo Diocese, that with meek heart and true reverence, they may hear and receive your holy word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We appeal to you also, so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in every land, especially in Afghanistan, China, Germany, France, India, Iran, Israel, the Palestinian Authority, North Korea, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, South Korea, South Sudan, Uganda, and Ukraine, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold your gracious hand in all your works, that rejoicing in your whole creation, they may honor you with their substance and be faithful stewards of your bounty. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And we most humbly implore you in your goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor Stephen, Pam, Ellen, Eric, Connie and Andy, Lonnie and Kingsley, Dutt, Kathy and Steve, Richard, Joan, Dirk, Clarence, Cindy, Martha, and Loris, Laura, and all the dispossessed people in Mississippi, and all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any adversity. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And we also bless your holy name for all your servants departed this life in faith and fear, calling on you to grant them continual growth in your love and service and to grant us grace so to follow the good examples of blessed Francis of Assisi and of all your saints, that with them we may be partakers of your heavenly kingdom. O oh God, who wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature, grant that we may share the divine life of him who humbled himself to share our humanity your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Quiet. I figure I have to go back to work. Okay. Um, this is a time where we uh, share the key, uh, the sh share blessings, excuse me, for birthdays and anniversaries. So, are there any, any parishioners here that have a birthday or anniversary that they want to celebrate and be prayed for? All may, some should, none must. I think we have no takers today. But, oh, Jane Anderson, no taker, all right. Is this a birthday? All right, so we're gonna pray for Dana on his uh, birthday or near his birthday. Let us pray. Oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray on your servant Dana as he begins another year. Grant that he may grow in wisdom and grace 
and strengthen his trust in your goodness all the days of his life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Many happy returns of the day. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, we're going, to take, we're going to continue taking communion standing, and I'm going to figure out how we resource and go back to the kneeling thing, but it's going to be after Easter, so I'm just telling you all, here's your warning, and, and we'll get prepared for it, and I have to think of the logistics, but we're going to continue to do it standing today. I think we have one chalice, so I'm going to post my chalice over here, and as you come through, if you want to take the chalice, uh, drink from the chalice, and just pass by my friend Phil who's my, uh, my, my assistant, and I'll be here to distribute the bread. All may take of the chalice, some should take of the chalice, but none must take of the chalice. So we're asking you to drink, not in tink, and that's how we'll run it. Um, if you need gluten-free bread, just put your hands together like this, and I'll know to get gluten-free bread. And if you want a blessing instead of a um, uh, taking communion, you can do it by crossing your arms across your chest, and I'll know. And with that, I invite you to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
service continues with the great thanksgiving for Eucharistic prayer A, and it begins on page 361, 361. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal feast, that fervent in prayer and in works of mercy and renewal.